So I'm just um, going to show you, uh, you know, the little map here. Oh, actually, you're right, 28, I'm wrong. Uh, so 52 countries, it depends actually on your definition. It's really fascinating because each of our countries has its own definition, also our own postal code system, what we classify as Europe and what we don't. Um, I can't now walk with my thing, but um, it is fascinating because, you know, we just had the Eurovision contest. Yeah, I mean, Ukraine won, um, but have you heard of other countries who don't sound like European to you in there? Any, you remember that Azerbaijan won a few years ago and Israel is part of it? So it really depends on your nation's definition who is part of Europe and who is not. And the problem is because our continent is not surrounded by water only, and we can define who's part of Europe and who's not. Do you know where the word Europe comes from? That was, it was uh, Zeus at that time, um, and he donated that to a goddess, Europa, he donated to, like, you know, as sacrifice or whatever, gave her the continent as the offering and said, this is yours uh, to control. This is the one thing where we got the name from. And then the, a second uh, meaning which um, the word Europe has, when you look at the origin of the word, it means everything west from the east. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly the problem for us. Everything west of the east, where do we define the borders? You know, like where does Europe stop and where, where does it start? That's the same with Turkey. You know, we have a European small side and a very big Asian side. You know, some parts of Russia are part of Europe, some are not. You know, that is, makes it very hard for people to engage. Of course, then we also know the Schengen visa situation and when we travel through Europe and who's buddies with whom and so on. But it is absolutely crazy. And uh, the, one of the things which have really um, struck me, um, how often we Christians treat our continent very lightly. Um, we just take things for granted. Like we, for the, one of the largest, longest time of peace we've had in Europe today, we had 70 years of peace after the Second World War, if we take out you know, the, the Balkan um, War, which was um, very bad, but it was a very long time of peace. And you can't find that time of peace in Europe over the last thousand years. So actually, we are completely blessed um, that there is uh, no war happening at the moment across our whole continent. Um, but actually, I think we are in deep troubles at the moment, and there are there's civil unrest waiting in various countries, and uh, there's something bubbling underneath, which I think should really bring us onto our knees. And I think it was yesterday or this morning, I think that Emmanuel from the stage, um, he said, you know, um, give me Europe or I die. You know, John Knox said, give me Scotland or I die. That was his daily prayer on his knees. I don't know if you have read, you know, the story of the Scottish revivalist, and when he was, I mean, the British know that probably better than I, but when he was, you know, found and, and he died, um, they found that his knees were so bent, crooked from these years of praying on his knees that they put his back when they wanted to put him in a coffin, you know, because it was, he was out of shape. He was a man of prayer, so desperate to see a change in Scotland. And I, and I hope that when we get out of the session, we maybe are very burdened, what we've heard and discussed and, and from each other, but also say, you know, God, really give me Europe or I die. You know, that we are willing to pay the price to see a change happening again in our continent. And uh, we see lots of stuff happening. Um, we have, um, you saw how many millions we've got here in Europe. That's, this is the, you know, the European part, not just the EU. The European Union has 500 million uh, on it at the moment. How, do you know how many evangelicals we have across Europe? It's actually 20 million evangelicals at the moment. And uh, so this is, uh, if you think, I mean, 20 million sounds good at first, but when you compare that to the size of our continent, um, this is very, very little. And out of these 20 million, we have about 1.5 youth and children, right? And that's also partly, of course, due to our population projection and also the population we, we find in all. We, the statistic, um, uh, says when, when you look at the, um, let me just start with that one first. Where it's blue, uh, the fertility, fertility rate is much, much lower. You know, people, the countries are losing numbers. And it will be really interesting now also to see with the new 
refugees coming into our countries, actually, they revive some of our lost members, um, especially in Germany. Um, we're going to lose uh, big numbers in the future. And so actually the refugees are a blessing to us um, if they're well-educated and so on. If we can integrate them to society, they can actually make a huge, uh, uh, you know, bridge the gap, which we're going to have uh, very, very soon in the future with all these engineers and so on missing. So we're, the more blue it is, the, more, uh, the less people we've got. And we need a, um, do you know the reproduction uh, percentage we need to keep a country stable? Yeah, to 1.8, depends. If you just want to level it's 1.8, and then if you want to see some growth, you need to have it higher. Which is fascinating because we, some of we, we think of the Muslims, you know, that they're going to come and they are all into producing, uh, you know, lots of babies. Interestingly, when they're here for the second generation, they're already on 2.4 only. So it is uh, getting down and quite, um, quite quickly. So we're going to lose in Europe about 60 million people over the next few, uh, like 20, or is it until 2060, um, if there's no, nothing happening in our countries, um, not trying to encourage families and the different laws made um, by the EU and other nations. If you have questions to that, or you think it's different in your country, then I'm very happy to tell me. But this has got a huge effect on our youth ministry. You know, I work with youth, and uh, today, you, you see, we not only know that we are losing the, the youth in our churches, like big time, but also we have less, you know, youth to cater for. Uh, it is very hard um, you now to, to actually build your church on youth because, I mean, numbers are just getting lower. When you thought it was very easy to get 10,000, you know, youth to your event, today you're happy when you get 5,000. You know, and that's just also related to birth rate, but also, of course, also to the decline of Christianity. But there's another thing in there, which I think is very important, and is what do we do with the older generation? Someone on the bus traveling here said, this is the biggest loss, he says, for our churches across Europe today, that we do nothing for the older generation. You know, the senior program in our churches and engaging with each other and saying, you know, you adopt a youth, you're going to do something for the order, is there you know, anything you can do across generational? Are you with me on this or agreeing? See that in your churches, the, the trends? and um, Because I don't know how much you're familiar, but it just comes to my mind, you know, the, the study that in the US, you know, the, the Kara Powell did the big study on sticky faith. Have anyone of you come across sticky faith? No? It is an excellent study by the Fuller Institute on youth and research worldwide, you can Google it, Sticky Faith, and it's fascinating because they in America found out that 80% of all young people lose the faith by the age of 18. 80%. This is once they're off to uni, this is where they're going to just hit it, you know? And it's just because the cybership and everything it is, you know, doesn't, uh, it's not the topic now, but it's huge. And so in, in Europe at the moment, we estimate that we lose about 60 to 70 percent of the young ones, that we can't bridge from youth ministry to the adult services and so on, keep them in church. And so please uh, read up on this one. Uh, I, I, I try to teach the European pastors about it because if we are not on our knees and we're getting desperate here, the youth will just go out uh, and do their own thing and not even come back to Christ. So uh, you can see my burden here. And then, of course, we have the huge topic uh, around migration in Europe. And uh, I have to say also some of the st statistics here, um, they're like some five years old, just because some, you know, I don't know how much you're, you know, work with studies and surveys, but sometimes it takes you know, three years uh, until you bring data again onto the market and you collect it and analyze and so on. And so there's the European Value Study, for example. If you're interested in Europe, you can just Google the European Value Study, uh, which gives you also great insights into Europe. So migration is very, very strong. Um, lots of migration within the European continent, but also lots um, outside. And I have to say that, uh, because I've got my Spanish brother here, that I'm owing a lot of these slides uh, to my professor, to memory that uh, as we worked over the last four years together and trying to encounter what is happening here. So the, the top 10 origins of people applying for asylum in the EU is Syria, as you are well aware, it's Afghanistan, and then Iraq, Kosovo, and Albania, and so on. 
And now, for example, the German government is trying to get rid of all the Afghanis. So, you know, I don't know about your country, but lots of these countries are declared uh, as secure countries to go back to. Actually, we're sending them back into war zones. It's completely crazy. Um, but, you know, we're trying to reduce the numbers. And you know that, you know, Germany got a million uh, of refugees, and we're trying to now do everything to integrate them. But it's going to be a huge, huge challenge for all of us um, across Europe. Any idea how many migrant churches we've got in Europe? I think this, this number is big. It's about 140,000 migrant churches. Sometimes they are just 20 or 30, you know? I mean, like in Hamburg, um, we had never had the revival and blah, blah. We have about 10,000 Christians in my city, evangelical Christians. Um, we have more African churches than we have Baptist, Methodist, and Pentecostals, you know? So they are everywhere. And it's very fascinating how we're going to bridge that, that we're going to make use of the international churches than to, only, to engage with the refugees, but also engage with the Germans or the other Europeans in there. The largest church growth we see at the moment is uh, in, in a city, uh, in London actually, done by the migrant churches. There's a great book out there, Church Growth in Britain, 20, um, it's the last, it's looking at the last 15, 20 years of church growth in Britain. I uh, met a professor from the Anglican Church. Fascinating um, that there's something, you know, building up again. Right, and then again, we look at the age, you know, of migrants coming um, to Europe, and actually, they, they, are, they are right in that group, in that target group, where we actually need the young ones. And uh, I don't know, I'm so excited about the refugees. Um, sometimes I'm amazed, like in, in Germany, you have the big problem of, you know, everyone is scared of them. But then I think once you've met a refugee, it becomes very, it's a very different story. I thought I'm just going to open my house for Christmas and invited various refugees and homeless people. It was awesome. So that was really Christmas for me. And now I've seen several of them become Christians just because they were in a German home. Someone welcomed them, loved them. And, you know, we, 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 we deal with apps, you know. They can put their Arabic in there, and I put my German in there, and then we somehow communicate. And, you know, and now my friends are producing on CD and, and little chips for the mobile phones across Europe that you know, goes out to the refugees. I mean, I, I have my friend in Greece. I'll, I'll show you later pictures of... I went, went to see the refugee um, crisis in Athens at the harbor when the 6,000 people were stranded there, coming straight from the, from the ships and so on. And my friend there in Greece, he just got 80,000 Arabic Bibles delivered as a present from the States and 40,000 Persian Bibles. And they just go out. I mean, they just go out. They find Christ. And at every single border, refugees had to go through in Europe. There were Christians there serving them water, putting up shower containers. We think in Germany that we are at the start of a mini revival among Iranians. I just shared with you... Um, we, got it. we see thousands of Iranians at the moment coming to Christ. And now it has got into public media. And I'm just getting a bit goosebumps here. Of course, it's so exciting. We think, you know, they just come and they're just going to, you know, do whatever, rob us and so on. They're finding Christ. They're queuing up in front of our churches. That the media, the newspapers are writing about. The television is right there when 60 Iranians are baptized. It is, it is hitting the news, and I think something is going to spark our, our life back into our churches in Germany, in the UK, and other nations. So sometimes I think, actually, we're not cursed because of the million of refugees. I think it's going to be a huge blessing, and we're going to see momentums among the Muslim world. They say it's the biggest shaking ever on earth, which we have at the moment among the Muslim world. And I think if we, the Christians, are there at the forefront, we're going to see something awesome. And lots of them just see, you know, visions and dreams. So they apply, of course, for the EU. And um, that makes it very hard. Then, of course, that we send them back home and uh, trying to negotiate. And, yeah, so it's going to be a big struggle. And I think, I wonder, you know, what, do, what is it that the migrants, you know, see in Europe? What is it? You know, is it they think that Christian content is there, and you know, it's not. Uh, but they come with this big expectation, you know, think this is what a Christian looks like. And uh, I just uh, get very worried about it, about it really. And uh, one of the statistics which I found is um, that we see government restriction 
happening much, much more in our society, in Europe today. So it can be that you don't always find your, your nation on there. I don't know if you even can see that. Um, can you see anything in the back, actually? Probably not. You're just guessing, yeah? <laughs> but you can see Turkey up there with the, with the strongest restriction uh, by the society. And then very secular, Czech Republic is, is the most, one of the most secular nations in Europe next to uh, maybe Estonia, but it um, depends on where you're from, you know? But now we see this increased, um, that the government is much, much more restricting um, Christianity and religion in general in Europe, trying to control the problem which is out there. And we had this massive, um, massive um, court cases in Europe. And just an example which I found, you know, starting that you are not allowed to wear religious symbols anymore. You know, that they take crosses out of classrooms that you're not allowed to be, you know, veiled in school. It doesn't only just apply to the Christians, now it applies to anyone being religious now in public. Um, any one of you knows of any cases in your area? Oh, it's the same with the, with the couple who didn't, uh, who refused to do the cake for the gay couple, you know? Um, it, it's, it's growing and um, everywhere. We have a much harder time now getting into um, civil uh, rooms and halls in society. If they ask me, is a religious event for youth? No, thank you. You know, so they're putting lots and lots of um, uh, doors now into that. And I question, how does God view Europe? Has he lost hope with our continent? What do you think? I don't want a theological answer, <laughs> which is easy to go to give, you know. But I, I want your your gut here, you know. It's it's one thing to have it in our mind; it's another thing to have it in our hearts, because it determines your message on a Sunday. It determines what you feel about investing into ministry. If you have lost hope and you think, look at the misery, um, then I think you know this is already we have lost. We've lost it, you know. But if we say, God, give us Europe or we die, you know, or like when Caleb came back, you know, and he was threatened in your number 13, you know, coming back and there were these giants in the country and, uh, and, and everyone said, you know, we, we can't do it. It's too big. It's too crazy and so on. What was Caleb's uh, response? Do you know his response? Absolutely. For surely we can do this. Surely there was this certainty in him with all these giants around. We can do it. And I'm, I'm hoping that God will instill the faith again in, in all of us and the hope. Because I see too many Christians around me in Europe who have just given up. And if you have given up, you become very phlegmatic in your approach. You you think church planning is nice, but what you really give it, I mean, Germany is so hard, and, and Spain, I just read again today, someone said, you know, Spain is the graveyard of missionaries, you know, it's so hard and so tough, and, and there you are, bringing hope to your nation, and you're seeing awesome things happening in Spain, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> so, Jeff Fountain and to memory, they are my two experts on Europe, they travel a lot through Europe, they teach about it, and... Uh, they are always so knowledgeable, and they do some master courses as well. And uh, Jeff Fountain, who was the uh, European Director for Youth with a Mission, and he now founded the Schumann Center, he says, this is how we have to view Europe. We have to look back, you know, beyond, forward, around, within, again, you know, and up. We need to get the multiple, uh, you know, view of how God sees it, how we have our history, and which can be built upon. I mean, uh, I'm not sure that I like the European Union so much at the moment. Uh, there are lots of laws which are uh, not good, and we have our Christian friends that are fighting on some of these laws for us as an evangelical community. But uh, do you know the story of the European Union? Who founded it? Oh, hello, David. And hello, sir. Who founded the European Union? Yeah, that's right, France and Germany. And who was, who was the catalyst? Who was the guy who was so bored? Yeah, Schumann. That's right, Robert Schumann. And uh, I find it fascinating because he looked at the continent after the World War and said, what can we do that we never again have a third, that we never again have a World War on our continent? 
So he, as a very devout Christian, he got on his knees and he prayed. He said, what is out there? And he dared and said, if France and Germany, if they, because the fight in wars is lots about what is in your soil, you know, what have you got to offer? And he said, if I can get these guys together, maybe we can make and cause a change here. So he was daring enough with another a Belgian friend and said, we're just going to go up. And he brought Adenauer and uh, the other French guy together in a monastery for three days. And they were struggling with what could we do. And they started this coal and steel agreement in uh, 52 or 56. I forgot now the date. And then out of this came later on a European Union and grew from 10 nations to 17 and now today to 28. Um, but it came from a zeal of saying, God, this shall ne ne never again happen on our continent. Do you get me there? You know, people who are taking the guts and say, I'm, I'm not accepting the status quo. So Europe has become a mission field. And uh, I think for the last 10 years now, we, we talk about reverse mission. We are now accepting missionaries and the Americans and others to come onto our continent and help us. We are praising God for these hundreds and thousands you know, of migrant churches who are something reviving. And uh, maybe this is crazy, but one of my very uh, German uh, famous pastor friends in Hamburg, he goes onto these soap boxes, you know, he just does his rally uh, outreach on the streets, and he speaks very bad English. But he does it in English, people stop, you know, and they think, oh, thank you. he must have something to say, and he looks very German. And he's got a black guy who interprets into German, you know. And so people just stop and listen. And if he tried that in German, no one, I mean, they, they would just shout at him. They would just, I don't know, throw tomatoes or so. You know, there's something about the foreignness which we find attractive. So what about these, now these thousands of Iranians who become Christians and others as well? You know, how can we get them engaged and say, you know, share, you have got uh, something. And uh, I looked at the word crisis because we talk about the crisis a lot in Europe. And I really love the, the working definition, which we've come up in our uh, master course. And it says, you know, coming from the word crisis, uh, which says, you know, judgment or choice, we said it's a crucial or a decisive moment in the course of events that may affect an individual, group, community, or a whole society. Okay, so it's a crucial or a decisive moment in the course of events that may affect, you know, an individual person, group, community, or whole society. And I think uh, we're now at the, you know, at the time, at the edge in Europe, where we're going to have to make a decision. You know, saying, God, we're hopeful, we're going to see you doing something. We're going to, you know, re-energize. We're going to go into much more church planning efforts than ever before. We're going to look after our younger leaders. We're going to try and with all our might and power and prayer, uh, going to see a change across Europe. Or are we just going to be very, become very fatalistic, like lots of Christians around us, and say, this is it. You know, God has moved to Brazil, and he's in Africa at the moment. He's too busy there, so he can't do anything in our continent. Yeah. So how, how, how are we doing with all these, these crisis moments? Uh, and uh, I just want to touch lightly these um, moments. I'm sorry, the PowerPoint is off. Um, but in society, and when we look into history, Europe has always been in a crisis. When you just look at the titles of these books, maybe should we just put the, is, there, is the uh, whiteboard in the way for some of you? Um, but yes, you can see, you know, in 1598, they thought Europe was at its worst stake. Christianity is just going to diminish. It, it's gone. You know, and then next century, everyone thinks, oh, it's gone, you know, there's no hope, we're left alone, we're in solitude, we're just the only survivors. And then the next century, someone says, you know, something's happening. You know, we have the monks who, so who you know, who helped us to, you know, to bring scriptures into, uh, um, had it in their caves, you know, caring for it that we could have the Bible today. And I kept this picture, though it was done by the naughty Brits, I have to say. Uh, they, this is our favorite chancellor, Angela Merkel. Um, but, uh, you know, it was 2020, it was very decisive. You know, the, the financial crisis was hitting us badly. Uh, I know that the UK, I mean, we come to that Greece and, and Spain, and so all suffered. And, and now Angela Merkel trying to fight, you know, for, for seeing, you know, something happening. And then instead of calling this Armageddon, it was like the Eurogeddon, you know? It is the Euro thing. 
which we're now having also on our um, topic with the, with the UK at the moment, of course. So we're going to have the economic crisis in, um, in Europe, and uh, we have uh, lots of um, bad experiences in that. And also through that, we have social unrest happening, you know, with, with, the, with, the, with the gap between the poor and the rich, uh, between the black and the white in some areas, uh, minorities to majorities. We are facing lots and lots of troubles. I don't know, where, where were the last city or street riots in Europe? Where were they? Istanbul. Yeah, Istanbul, very strong, yeah. Another? There were a few. Greece, Athens, very strong, led by young ones. The same as in Turkey, was led by young ones. We had, was it 2012 then? The, the street riots there. We had France and Paris, very bad. For the first time, we had it in our city in Hamburg. Last year, with hundreds and thousands of young ones demolishing whole streets and everything. And who were the ones who picked up the pieces of glass and who swept the streets? Hmm? It was the Christians. I had great stories of 24-7 in London, cleaning streets and churches getting together and adopting streets and cleaning, clear, clearing the glasses and blood and, and so on from, from the pavements. The same on Maidan, you know, in the Ukraine. It was the Christians there having a 24-hour prayer tent there for, for quite a few months um, and so on. So there is something bubbling there, you know, that, they're, that the Christians reacting. And uh, it's often the young ones who are marching against, but it's also the young ones with the help of the church is then saying, you know, we're going to do something here. So this, of course, affects hugely our debts in our countries. And you know that from television. You know um, how bad it is in your own nation. But some of those is good to know, if you're not on the top, you know, top five or so, that sometimes we think our country is worse, the worst ever. Then you realize actually some are worse. But actually, our debt at the moment with these countries, and this has huge consequences on our young ones, is you know, Greece heading it up badly. Um, you know, they just have, I mean, taxes, which are more taxes than uh, you get income, and you're not only allowed to draw two or 400 euros a day, or, I mean, lots and lots of restrictions now on them. When we were there, it was, it was just incredible. Italy, Portugal, Ireland, you can probably see your own country here as well, where you are at. And that, of course, now plays heavily into the unemployment of youth. This is huge. And this is, of course, where we, where we see Spain at the top. And, um, and the other countries fall in Greece, Croatia, Italy, Cyprus. So these young ones have nothing to do. I mean, they say in Spain it's 75% uh, unemployment among people below the age of 25, including the students who are not employed. But it's huge. And what is the response of Christians? Christians. And then, of course, we come to uh, Christianity as such, uh, the post-Christendom. And let me read what um, Stuart Murray said about that one. I want to quickly tackle that one. Post-Christian is the culture that emerges as the Christian faith loses coherence within a society that has been definitely shaped by the Christian story and as the institutions that have been developed to express Christian convictions decline in influence. And there are some book suggestions just for you later also to look at if you wanted to. But um, what we find out is that, that our Christianity and our perception of Christianity is changing. And that we thought we were at the center, we're going to determine our cultural outcomes, and now we, we are pushed to the margins. I mean, there is the, you know, you're going to come and want to bring something Christian or Christian rallies. I mean, like in Brussels or in Belgium in general, it's not allowed anymore to do street evangelism. You know, I don't know if you open air campaigners, oh, and they're always out there on the streets. Now today it's forbidden for any religious group because the Muslims were too aggressive and then some of the African churches were too aggressive. So now it's banned for the whole country. It's crazy. And then of course we come from a majority now to being the minority. And sometimes I think we churches, we behave like we're in this little bubble and the world has just stayed the same and we don't get it that the world is just going down and we are still in there in this little comfort zone and, and think, you know, let's just stay safe and log up, you know, protect our little flock that we're going to make it. 
You know, but I want to think as, let us think big and expect big. And then we, we, this is the terminology they use, you know, in post-Christian, that we have become, you know, from settlers, we were the ones inhabiting the place, now we become the sojourners. We are the ones who are now wandering about and thinking, you know, where do we fit in society? And then, of course, from the privilege of being, you know, being the dominant religion, now we become, you know, turned into plurality, which we also, I mean, John um, Piper discussed this morning as well. And then the, the last uh, slide on this one here, it's from control to witness. You know, at once the state churches were dominating the scene, and some countries, of course, they still are, but I mean, also the Orthodox and Catholic are losing big numbers in Europe, as well as the Lutheran churches. Um, so we are no longer the ones saying to society how it works, but actually now we turn into being witnesses again. Uh, from maintenance uh, to mission, you know, we no longer can maintain a great, big, uh, successful church in Europe. We're starting to do missions again. And from institution, now we see that there's a journey towards movement, what is happening in the countries. Right. So there, there are five perspectives. I just want to quickly uh, touch here. Uh, five ways of how people see, um, you know, the secularization on Europe. Oh, sorry, let me just uh, go back here. So one, Murray says Christendom has collapsed. Now we're now part of the post-Christendom, so this is it, where the church has lost its privileges. You can read up later. Wesley says Europe was never truly Christianized. Because I thought it was interesting when ELF last night um, said something about re-evangelizing Europe. Quite a few theologians would say Europe was never evangelized. It was done by force and power in some areas, you know, so uh, you're going to find these different views on it. Or the third one is pre-Christian religios religiosity continues to rebound, which means that the paganism which we had in Europe for many years is now again rising up. Spirituality is, is not uh, evaporating, it's not diminishing, but actually the religion as such, the institution. Sorry, what am I doing here? I'm kicking something in the night, something happens. And then um, Davis is a very strong lady writing on Europe, and you know, hers is Believing Without Belonging, which she very much uh, created as a terminology, that you, that you uh, believe without belonging, that you, that you just, you know, you don't belong anywhere. And we see the same now among even evangelical Christians in Europe. Like we say in Hamburg, half of the evangelical Christians do not belong to any church any longer. See, Peter Wagner always called them the marble Christians. They just, you know, roll from church to church. If they don't like it here, they go there, and they never, you know, commit. Uh, it's very hard to calculate your income and so on. And uh, then the fifth one here is the religion is just a, sh a chain of memory. And I am wrong. I, there were seven here. Secularization is irresistible. Bruce says it's going to come for Europe, or there's a collapse of a shared discourse. So just the different perspectives, and also I think maybe for us to um, think about uh, what is our, um, our our position on this here. Um, Radcliffe College and the, the, the university I was doing my degree with, and to memory, they they did a, a research among young ones and saying, you know, what is it? What is it among young ones? Is there a lack of you know uh, interest in spirituality or not? It's really fascinating. Something's moving here. I don't know what. It's like the spirit maybe wants me to hurry up or so. <laughs> but uh, there's the link, and you can have the slides later on if you wanted to. Anyway, I'm just going to give you what we found. Um, uh, the importance of religion among young ones. Um, and I try not to. I don't know what it is. Um, but uh, in some, you know, it's, it's a big decline, you know, how, how young ones view religion. Yeah, and, uh, and interestingly, you can see that in some countries, it's either stable or actually it goes up. There are some, we call them bounces. Something is happening among the young ones, and we're not sure yet what, but it seems that in some countries where we've never seen any, any uh, progress or any growth in church, now some growth is happening. Something which I thought was really interesting. So it says there's some bounces of relig religious interest among the youth. And they say it's interesting because there's something happening in Bulgaria and the Czech Republic, which never happened maybe before in the, in the past uh, few decades. Um, resurgence of relig relig religiosity among the youth. 
And uh, maybe some other interesting thing here that they are, that they are thinking. Some of these, like Kaufmann and so on, suggest maybe that secularization now has to reach its highest point. You know, we, we see you know things changing again across uh, Europe. Um, um, so we just have to see how it goes, you know, but I think it's interesting to talk about predictions and see what's happening out there. Um, because sometimes people have portrayed a very bleak picture, but then they forget God out of, you know, they forget that God is on the move and he's still going to do something around Europe. Um, my last slide here was uh, about this uh, sociologist, um, it's a French name, I can't pronounce it anyway, but um, about um, in 1950 or so he made an analysis and he said, it takes 2% of a group to cause a change. Uh, you know, a famous sociologist, so you can check it up, you can find it easily on the web, but also you can have my slides here. But he said, it only takes 2%, it takes a minority to cause a change. So this is my encouragement to us, as we're now a minority in Europe, and you know, I've been to Montenegro, they have got 75 indigenous Christians. Most of them are under 25 years of age, you know. And we're out there cheering them on, saying, you can do it. You can see a change. It's amazing. There's Vladimir here, Chismanski. Some of you maybe know him from uh, Serbia, mi missionary in Montenegro. He has filled the stadium of 6,000 people when they all came to hear Nick Vujicic. And Nick Vujicic prayed for the crowd of these 6,000. And uh, I just think, what, what a testimony. <laughs> There's a single you know, missionary out there in this, such, such a tiny country. But he creates, you know, because God uses him, he brings about a change in, in a small country like of Montenegro. So let's just be encouraged. And uh, maybe two of us can maybe just pray for our continent and uh, pray for wisdom for our leaders and, and the governments we're, um, we're dealing with. <laughs>